All right. What's the point of Leviticus? Who can, who can tell me? Dwell with God. Dwell with God. What else would you say? God is holy. Therefore, we shall be holy. We should be holy. All right. We got work to do, it sounds like. Was there a passage in the, uh, well, really anywhere in the Bible, but a passage calling us priests, us, Christians, priests? 1 Peter 2, Peter 2 Revelation. Revelation 1, 5, and 20. Also, you go to Genesis, and the original plan for humans is to be priests uh, in God's uh, presence. What are the elements of the consecration process in Leviticus 8 and 9? Washing with water. There was blood sacrifice and the sprinkling on the priests. Eating, get new clothes, right? Uh, washing, new clothes, anointing with oil, sacrifices, dipping in blood, eating, waiting for uh, the ordination, all that. Okay, what was the sin of Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10? Strange fire, Strange fire which had not been commanded. And then uh, what would you say, we'll pick up with this here in a minute, uh, what would you say is a short answer, um, best answer you can give of why God gave all the clean and unclean requirements in Leviticus 11 to 15? To set them apart, Denise says, okay? Um, and uh, we'll run with that in just a second. I do want us, uh, you don't have to memorize it necessarily, and as always, these charts, uh, our team does a great job of keeping all this stuff available, recordings and uh, the PowerPoint files. Uh, so you don't have to memorize this per se, but I do think this is, will be important for you, helpful for you going forward to have this in your mind. What is the point of Leviticus? And to think about it, not just in terms of isolated phrases or themes, but to actually construct it as a purpose, right? The purpose of the book is to instruct Israel in what is required so that Yahweh can dwell among them, okay? Uh, and that atonement and holiness are central to God dwelling with his people. And this kind of works out well here because we talked about holiness, and we'll keep talking about that in Leviticus 11 to 15, and then we're going to focus on atonement here in Leviticus 16. Okay, our goals for the class. We're trying to take seriously the holiness of Yahweh. We are giving thanks to or for Jesus and we are to live consecrated lives as priests, holy to the Lord. All right, uh, we have two things I want to kind of pick up with from class number five, which was last week. I want to kind of return to the logic of, uh, of all this clean and unclean stuff, right? We didn't get to last week some examples of Jesus coming into contact with uncleanness. I think that's uh, helpful, interesting, important to note. And then for class number six today, we'll try to define atonement and explain its role in the book, describe what's done with the two goats on the Day of Atonement, and then compare and contrast all of that with Jesus uh, in the New Covenant. All right. So, uh, in the structure of Leviticus, we were here last week in 11 to 15, and I gave you this uh, towards the end of class as kind of some thoughts about why all the clean and unclean, what's the logic behind it. And as Denise already said, the green box here, I think, is the, is the shortest, best, easiest, uh, most concise answer, right? Where we don't have to speculate, we don't have to get into things that we don't fully understand. We can just say God is requiring his people to be holy, to be set apart in every aspect of life. Okay? Uh, and remember, because God is holy, who gets to define what holiness is but God, right? And so in that sense, there's not necessarily a requirement to explain why all these things are, are, are given to God's people. He defines What's holy and what's unholy? What's clean and what's unclean? And he requires his people to live by that holiness. And not just in public, not just when they come into worship or to the assembly, but as we saw, in every area, even the most private areas of life. Okay? But with the rest of this, there's some more things, I think, to think about. Uh, and one of those goes back to creation. God is holy because he is the source of life. He is the creator of life. He is, remember that, that was, he defined to, to, to Moses, I am and there is no other. 
That means that He is, everything else comes from Him. He's the Creator. And He created life with an order, with boundaries. You see that even in the animal and the plant world, right? There are clear distinctions between species. And, and the closer you get to the edges of those lines, things start to break down. You understand that in like breeding or cross-pollination or whatever. There are specific boundaries and lines. This is the way God has made life, with, with boundary, with order. And those things must be respected. And for the law of unclean and unclean, one of the things we saw is that there seems to be something going on with life and death. The things that are associated with death are, are, are uh, impure. Um, and when you are impure, having touched something of this sort of association, then you cannot come into the presence of God, uh, who is the source of life. And so we might diagram it this way. We have Yahweh, remember, and even in the background of all these slides, you, you see what I'm getting at here, right? That, that pillar of fire, God dwelling with his people. Yahweh is holy, he is the source of life, he is the creator. And like the sun, he is the source of all life. And that power source is also immensely dangerous uh, because of, of how forceful it is and how powerful it is, okay? But God is coming down to dwell in a fallen world because of sin, and this world is full of death. Uh, that was the consequence for sin, right? Was, was death for the humans. And so the world is filled with sin and with uncleanness and with impurity. And so if God is going to dwell among his people as he wants to do, then the people have to draw very strict lines to keep those things that are impure, keep those things that are associated with death out, and to preserve and celebrate life as God has ordained it. And as they do that, whenever they come in contact with things that are associated with death, as, as whenever they come in contact with things that make them impure, they must deal with that before then coming back into the presence of God, uh, who is holy and the source of life. Okay, uh, any questions about this? Feel free to ask. We have a couple minutes here. Um, anything here that, I wouldn't say anything that doesn't make sense, because there's a lot here that doesn't make sense to me, but any questions you want to ask that would clarify or, or uh, help you in some way here? Okay. Let's talk about Jesus and uncleanness briefly before we move on to the Day of Atonement, okay? Um, last week we skipped over this, um, and we went to the conversation about the law, even the laws of clean and unclean, being a tutor, being a help to lead us to Christ, right? And part of that uh, is, implies or, or says directly that the law ne doesn't apply in the same way anymore, right? And you actually see that there's some New Testament passages that may be of interest. Mark 7, Jesus is talking about, you know, it's not what goes into you that defiles you, it's what comes out. And Mark says there in a kind of parenthetical statement, thus he declared all foods clean. Also, you have the story of Peter being told by God to kill and eat these unclean animals in Acts 10 as a picture of bringing in the Gentiles. Romans 14, Paul talks about really there's no difference in what you eat. You just respect each other's consciences in that way. And then uh, we alluded this morning to 1 Timothy 4, Paul saying everything is clean to eat. So clearly there's a change in the covenant, and these laws in Leviticus, for instance, of, of purity and impurity, um, teach us about Christ, even if they are not kept in the same way. Okay, And the idea of the tutor, as we saw last week from Galatians 3, says that these laws are not just to be thrown out and not paid attention to, because like the rules you have as, as, as children, that's the analogy Paul's working with there, there's something about these laws that teach us about God and about ourselves that help us in maturity as sons and daughters of God in Christ. And we've talked, again, about some of those larger principles, okay? But I think behind all of this, the fact that we are now in a new covenant in which these laws of clean and unclean don't apply, I think behind all of this is this important point about Jesus that we, uh, that we want to make here. And so I'll start by asking you this question. Think about the various things that were mentioned in Leviticus 11, okay? Uh, whether that's the foods that were talked about, the dead bodies, the carcasses of animals that were talked about, uh, bodily fluids that were talked about, uh, the diseases that were talked about, all these things in Leviticus 11 to 15, 
Do you remember any stories in the Gospels where Jesus comes directly into contact with any of these sources of impurity that are described in Leviticus? Lazarus, Terry says, okay, Lazarus was uh, dead, right? Yeah. Four days dead. Jesus healed a leper, Brian says, okay, leprosy being one of the things that uh, was impure, unclean. Yeah, there were, there were some other dead people. There was a dead girl, uh, the Jairus' daughter, um, that uh, Jesus came into contact with. Yeah, um, and just because, you know, I just really want to keep saying menstrual impurity in a Bible class, uh, we should understand that's exactly what that is in the story. It's actually a combo story of Jairus' daughter and the woman with the flow of blood or the issue of blood. It says in the text, um, that's almost certainly a menstrual bleeding in the category of Leviticus uh, 15. Remember, there were normal bleeding and there was abnormal bleeding. And hers was clearly abnormal. And it put her in an unclean state. And she comes up and touches Jesus, right, um, in her impure state. Sure. Th yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Yeah, so Jesus' interaction with all different kinds of people, maybe not quite in the category of it makes you unclean. That was kind of imposed by the Jews, right? That if you eat with Gentiles, it's unclean. Um, and we have no evidence that Jesus like sat down and ate a BLT with Gentiles or anything. Uh, but still, I think that interaction is a more general picture of, of what we see. So y'all mentioned more that I didn't even have up here. But you have Jesus coming into contact with this uncleanness. Now, why does this matter? What do we learn about Jesus in these stories like him touching the leper in Mark 1, the woman with the flow of blood touching him in Mark 5, uh, coming in contact with dead bodies? What does this teach us about Jesus? He cleanses and heals. Remember what we've been reading in, in, in Leviticus. Uh, what happens... Well, not actually you or I, because we're different covenant, whatever. What happens when you or I comes in contact with impurity? You're unclean, right? That's the, how that works in Leviticus. The person who touches the dead body, you're unclean. You got to go wash. You got to go through the rites and then come back, okay? For Jesus, it works the other way, right? His holiness is such. And again, go back to our chart, okay? We talk about this brilliant holiness of God. That's Jesus, right? Uh, God in the flesh, the creator of life in the flesh. And so when he, in his immense holiness, touches uncleanness, it doesn't make him unclean. His holiness transfers, we might say. And that's why the leper is cleansed. That's why the woman is healed of her flow of blood. That's why Lazarus comes back to life. Why Jairus' daughter comes back to life. Okay? Because his holiness, his life is so powerful that it flows outward. And there were pictures of this in the prophets. Um, there's the, the picture in Ezekiel 40 to 48 of the temple of God in the new covenant, not a literal temple, but a symbolic picture of God's dwelling place. And there's this stream that flows out of the temple and the stream turns into a river and it rushes out, uh, you know, in the southern part of, of Judah towards the, the Dead Sea and it revives the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea becomes fresh. Now there's life teeming in it. That's a picture of God's holiness in Jesus and in the new covenant. Holiness and life that goes outward to cleanse, and we are the beneficiaries of that. And then I would also say that as priests of God, Jesus' power works through us in the same way, that now our holiness can radiate outward and be a blessing to other people to make them clean and to make them holiness as they uh, make them holy as they see Jesus in us. Okay? Cool? All right. So uh Thankfully, now is a big sigh of relief. We're moving on from chapters 11 to 15, although surely some of these things are going to end up on a quiz later on. But let's talk about this central element of the book of Leviticus. The reason we have the outline in this way, as we've said before, is to emphasize that there is this kind of reverse parallel structure in Leviticus. And you have these brackets that match up. The laws of ritual purity match up with laws for moral purity in 18 to 20. The discussion of priests in 8 to 10 matches up with the discussion of priests in 21 to 22. The instructions for the ritual of sacrifice in 1 to 7 matches up with the instructions for rituals of the festivals in 23 and 25. And in the Hebrew Bible, this, this kind of uh, 
X tor sort of structure. It's called a chiasm. It's the Greek uh, letter X. It looks like X, at least. Um, in the middle is where the target is, where the attention of the focus is supposed to be drawn. And that in Leviticus is towards the Day of Atonement. So let's talk about the Day of Atonement uh, for the rest of this class. Again, in your booklet, there are some, some lessons, some online recordings that can help you more with the Day of Atonement if there are things that we don't get to because we're still a class behind uh, in our study here. All right. The word atonement, to make atonement, that's the word that keeps use, gets used tons of times in Leviticus and in this chapter, to make atonement. That word, kapar, or maybe it's pronounced kapar, it literally means to cover. By the way, Yom Kippur is, is how the Jews refer to this high holy day. And Kippur, kapar, you see the connection in those, that, that word there uh, in the modern Hebrew. Kapar is the word that means to cover, and that's what this word literally means, okay? Kind of interesting, um, a couple uses of this word already in the, uh, the Torah, in the Pentateuch, to help us maybe understand what it means. Uh, in a very literal and a very simple use of the word, in Genesis 6, this word to cover is used of what Noah did with the pitch or the tar to cover the ark. Okay, so that, have that image in your head, right? And then the, the, this word is used another time in the book of Genesis, in chapter 32, when Jacob is scared to death of what Esau is going to do to him because he's, you know, stolen his birthright, his blessing. Yeah, no big deal, right? Uh, but now he's got to confront Esau again after all these years. And he is just sure that Esau is coming in hot, right, with, with wrath and with revenge. And so Jacob puts together this big gift and all these animals, right? And he sends them to Esau. And what he hopes to do, the text says, is to cover Esau's face. The text, English translation will say to appease, right? to appease his face. So it's like the wrath of Esau is coming, and Jacob is trying to cover that, right, or to appease that. I think that helps us to understand uh, the sense of this word. And then one more use, although this is not the exact same word, it's the same root word uh, for, for atonement or cover, is used um, in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. And the lid that literally covers the Ark of the Covenant is referred to as this, with a word like this, a covering, right? And in our Bibles, it says the mercy seat, right? And I think we actually see the kind of full meaning of atonement in this one image of the mercy seat, okay? Literally, it covers the Ark. But obviously, it's much more significant than just a covering of the Ark. The reason it's called a mercy seat is because that covering is like covering over the people the covenant that they've broken, covering over their sin, because what's right above the Ark of the Covenant? Well, symbolically speaking, God, right? Yeah, the angels are on either side, and God is sitting right there, right, so to speak. And so you need a covering. You need a mercy seat. You need something there to appease the wrath of God. You need something there to, to deal with the sin, to cover over the sin so that God can dwell with his people. So I think this is the sense of the word to atone or atonement in the day of atonement and in the way that word is used all throughout Leviticus. It is a covering of sin. In the New Testament, the same word is propitiation, same meaning there, just different, uh, different word in the New Testament, or to expiate, expiation of sin. It is not sin being swept under the rug. It is sin being blotted out. Right, think about that image as well. Blotted out, taken care of, dealt with, to cover over the sin. All right? I asked you this question in your booklet, right? And you could probably answer it pretty quickly based on where we've been so far. Why is atonement such a big deal? If this is the sense of atonement, this is the concept of atonement, why is atonement such a big deal in Leviticus? We got, to, we got to appease the wrath of God so that so he can dwell among them, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think as Mike said, it's... it's uh, say that again? Therefore, their sin has to be covered over, removed, expiated, cleansed, in order for a holy God to dwell with the holy people. Thank you, Brian. And as you know already, uh, coming into uh, to this and probably even coming into this course, this atonement is hand in hand with blood, lots of blood, as it turns out, right? 
And the question would be, why is blood necessary for atonement? Um, what would you say if you were asked that question? Why so much blood? Why is blood necessary for atonement? What would be your answer? See someone else. Sharon, what, do you, what would you say? Blood, and the blood itself is, is what is representative of life. Life is in the blood, Sharon says. The blood is representative of life. Jordan, you were? Blood's always been required. Precedent for it. Okay, it's always been required. Historical precedent. Brian, quickly, what were you going to say? Uh, I think it's been covered, but life is in the blood, and God says, I give you the blood for atonement. Thank you. So uh, if you go back to our outline here, right, I have 16 and 17 listed. This is the instructions for the Day of Atonement. Really, chapter 16 is the instructions for the Day of Atonement. If you read chapter 17, you're kind of like, well, this isn't really exactly about the Day of Atonement. It's kind of like an addendum. And there's a couple of things going on in chapter 17. One of those in the first uh, seven to nine verses of Leviticus 17, we won't read it. But it's basically instructions that the sacrifices need to be centralized. Uh, and God says, no more just sacrificing, you know, uh, on your own in your own tent. The sacrifices need to take place here at the tabernacle. Right? And you can see how that would relate to the Day of Atonement, this high holy day. Right? But it's not exactly, uh, you know, it's kind of an addendum instruction to that. And then similar with the rest of chapter 17. Let's read this. Let's start in verse 10. I have verse 11 on the board, but let's start in verse 10. And think about this. You're like, this is not the Day of Atonement here. But... As in line with the comments that have been made, think about how this would relate to atonement and uh, what's happening on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 17, verse 10. If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For, verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person shall among you shall eat blood. Neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Any one of the people of Israel or the strangers who sojourns among you who takes in hunting or any beast or bird that may be eaten shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore, I have said to the people, you shall not eat any blood of any creature, so on and so forth. Okay, so as has been said, uh, life and death is right here and relevant. As we talked about with the holiness of God as the source of life, death is kept out by strict boundary. When there is sin, that sin has a consequence of death. This goes all the way back to Genesis 3, the first command basically given was, shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. That death comes upon the humans because of their sin. They are cast out of the presence of God. Uh, Jordan may have been referring to this in terms of historical precedent. Interesting that after their sin and, and, and their nakedness, they're covered with animal skins. God gives them animal skins to cover them. Where do you think the skins came from? All right, we may be speculating, but I don't know how you get animal skins without killing an animal. Right. So even there you have that. But the sin separates from God. It brings death. And so life must be paid in order to atone for the sin. And the life of the flesh is in the blood. And this is the logic that is central to the atonement. OK, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life is paid through the blood and that blood atones, covers over, blots out the sin so that. These sinful people can have their sin purged and then remain in the presence of the holy God and continue to enjoy his life as the creator. Cool? All right. Let's jump into quickly the, uh, the instructions in chapter 16 of the Day of Atonement. Um, and let's read a little bit here, and then we will uh, break down um, more or less what's going on here. So, this is actually interesting. Leviticus 16, verse 1. Uh, we miss this sometimes, at least I do. I kind of forget this is the way the chapter starts. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. See, all the instructions for the Day of Atonement are started with a reminder of Nadab and Abihu. 
and their kind of careless, flippant way that they came in before the Lord in a way that he hadn't commanded and the consequence of that. So just as a reminder, okay, this happened right after this. These instructions were given after that event. Verse 2, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, the covering of the ark, that is on the ark, so that he may not die. He can't come at any time, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come to the holy place with a bowl from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Verse 6. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Uh, or for the scapegoat, your translation may say. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Okay, uh, Verses 11 to 14 describe what's done with the bull, the sin offering, and as we already read reference to, there was a sacrifice the high priest had to make just to kind of cover his own sin as he goes in to perform this ritual. But the ceremony of the, uh, of the Day of Atonement really revolves around these two goats that have been described. Let's talk about them each in turn. The first of the goats is used as a sin offering. As we, uh, as we read uh, in the verse already. But it's given in more detail. Notice in verse 15. After the high priest has made atonement for his own sin, Leviticus 16, verse 15, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleannesses of the people of Israel and because their transgressions, all their sins, and so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleannesses. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. Okay, so this goat is killed as a sin offering for the people, it says in verse 15. But what is done with the blood of this sin offering? What do you see there in the text? Sprinkled on the mercy seat. Okay. What else is done with this blood? Yeah, it's taken to the altar. It's really taken all around both the holy place and the, uh, the parts of the tabernacle outside the holy place. And this is interesting. What does it keep saying is being, being done with this blood? Or what is it, what is it cleansing? The, what did you say, Dan? Didn't say directly it's cleansing the people. Cleansing the places. It actually says, though, that it's cleansing what? The impurities or the uncleannesses of the people. Right? Uh, this to me is interesting. I don't want to make too much of this. Right? Uh, but it's almost like and we'll see the other side of the coin with the, with the scapegoat. Right? Uh, but it's almost like with this sin offering, the blood is being cleansed. It's like cleaning up the mess the people have made. They've, they've, for a whole year, have defiled the tabernacle just because they're people, right? Obviously, there's all the rituals about coming in clean and offering sacrifices, but it's as if each year there's got to be a deep cleaning of the tabernacle. All those impurities, all the uncleannesses of the people got to be cleansed with the blood. So it's not so much the people that are being cleansed here, 
It's the spaces, the places, the, 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 the dwelling place where they are meeting God has to be cleaned up of those uncleannesses, is the idea, right? Um, then, on the other hand, we have the scapegoat. So one goat is used as a sin offering. The other one is used as a scapegoat. Let's read the, the more detailed instruction in verse 20, picking up where we left off. Leviticus 16, verse 20, When he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Okay, so this goat remains alive, at least for a time. And uh, I don't need to explain to you, I think, the symbolism of what's going on here. High, the high priest lays his hands on the head of the goat. He confesses the sin of the people. It's a really unique ceremony in, in Israel. No other ceremony is like this, where there is a confessing, a verbal confessing of the sin of the people. And then that goat is led off or sent off into the wilderness, okay? Now, what about that weird uh, Azazel thing we read earlier, okay? Azazel appears to be the name of, wait for it, <clears throat> a goat demon. And the idea is perhaps that, you see this, this idea in the Bible that, you know, inside the camp is safe and uh, kind of, you know, clean and where order is, where God is. Outside the camp in the wilderness is scary chaos. That's where the demons are. That's where the evil forces are. That's where the darkness is, okay? And so the idea uh, may be that the goat with all the sins of the people is being sent out to the place where it belongs, right? The sin is being sent outside into the, into the disorder, into the chaos, into the evil, into the darkness, with the demons, with the forces of evil. And that may be what's being indicated by saying uh, that these, this goat is, uh, goes out to Azazel, right? Um, but I know it's weird. And so if that doesn't make total sense to you, um, it doesn't make total sense to me either, right? But uh, in this way, and this is where I put it together with the other, right? And it, with the sin offering, it was as if the blood was cleansing the spaces of the tabernacle. Here, all the sins, all the iniquities are dumped onto this scapegoat, and those iniquities are taken away. And in that way, the iniquities are purged from the camp because they are taken out of the camp, borne away into the wilderness. And so the people now are free, are lifted, are purged of their sins uh, and their iniquities, and the places uh, of the tabernacle are cleansed of the impurity and uncleanness as well. With these two goats, the sin offering and the scapegoat. Yes, Mike. Uh, I just had, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just like two small questions. Where's the Azazel thing? Depending on your translation, for instance, the ESV says that in verse 8 and in verse uh, 10 and in verse, uh, yeah, in verse 10, verse 8 and 10. And it comes up again in chapter 17. There's a prohibition about uh, no more offering sacrifices to Azazel. So that may be related, that there was a problem, maybe the people had picked it up from Egypt, of worshiping or offering sacrifices to this goat demon. And God is saying, don't worship that goat demon anymore. And your sins in the Day of Atonement, they're going to go out you know, where they belong, out into the darkness, the chaos with this goat demon, and uh, outside of my camp, outside of my presence. Yes, Anita. Oh, sorry, you had two questions. Yeah, uh, just, just the other one real quick. When, when it says, like, he's confessing the sins of the people, I mean, I, that can mean a couple of different things. I mean, I assume he's not like, hey, everybody, like, write everything out, and I'm going to, like, read through, I know, like, read through it all. Like, I, I mean, what is, what is yeah. that? Yeah, I'm assuming it's a general confession of sin, right? Uh, not necessarily quick, like, oh, sorry, God, we've all sinned. Uh, like we sometimes do, but, you know, so thorough and, and, and contrite, but, uh, and maybe different kinds of sin. I don't know, maybe going through the law. I, I have no idea. I'm speculating here. Uh, and there may be something out there that would kind of record what the things that were said, you know, through the years. Um, but yeah, it's not, not literally confessing all the sins of all the people, but confessing the sins of the people generally is, I think, is the idea. Good questions. Anita? 
question. The Azale, is that used interchangeably with scapegoat? They're basically one in the same? Yeah, I mean, the, the translation, uh, most translations just put in scapegoat to kind of say this is what this goat is. He's the scapegoat, right? The word is Azazel, which uh, re uh, refers to this demon. So like the ESV has just put that in there, which you kind of need to explain, um, but that's, that's what it says uh, in the text. Yes, Brian. Uh, just a clarification. Yeah. Uh, what I'm seeing here are two aspects to atonement. One is bearing the sins, carrying your sins away from you through the scapegoat, and the other be the cleansing by the blood, which I would infer, therefore, would be Jesus bearing our sins away and the cleansing by his blood. Sure, I, I think both Old and New Testament, you see, you see both of those images used, right? Um, you know, the, the only way God can explain to us what is done with our sins is by using metaphor, right? And, and explaining things in a way that we can understand. And that happens in different ways. So yes, throughout the Bible, we see this metaphor of as far as the east is from the west, so I remove your sins from you. But also you see the imagery of washing you to be white as snow, right? With the blood. Uh, so, um, so yes, I think both of those metaphors show up here in the Day of Atonement, and both of them are obviously fulfilled in Christ, and we see them throughout Scripture. Speaking of, thank you, Brian, for the nice segue into uh, the last five to seven minutes or so talking about Jesus. And I want you to turn and talk here. Um, we've looked at some amount of detail out the rituals of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. So talk with your neighbor for a couple minutes. Where do you see Jesus in this text and in these instructions. Talk, and then we'll share out in a couple minutes. All right, that's the bell for five minutes left. So let's collect some answers, uh, end with this discussion, and preview next week um, a hushed, reverent conversation we just had. Maybe it's the solemnness of the Day of Atonement. Didn't want to be too loud. I can appreciate that. Um, what did you all talk about? Where do we see Jesus here in, these, in this text? Yeah, Michael, kick us off. We were talking about, um, well, the first goat, you see death or because of, you know, to make things clean because of sin and uncleanness. There's, death had to happen with the first goat. And then there was um, the, the blood, you know, that is the, you have the cleansing in the blood and the uh, atonement related to the blood. And then um, lastly, we notice with, in verse 22, um, it says literally, the goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself. And that sounds very much like what Jesus did. Bore, bore all the iniquities on himself. Cool. Thank you, Michael. And Michael's conversation partners. Yes, Tosin. So I'm going to read something from Hebrew 13, 11 to 12. So for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are born outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, in his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Hebrews 13. Uh, thank you, Tosin. Suffering outside the camp, going out to, uh, to, to de deal with and bear those sins. Other things. Brian. Uh, he's a high priest. Jesus, okay. of course, is our high priest, and this is the one offering the sacrifice for atonement of sins. Of course, Jesus offered himself for the atonement of sins, and from there you have the blood. The blood of Christ as in correlation to the blood of the <clears throat> sacrificial animals. I see washing also to enter into the church into heaven. There's that baptism element that I see as well. Thank you, Brian. Jordan? So this may actually be a question back. I don't know. <laughs> is, is Jesus, uh, do we see him in both goats then in this scenario? Because... You know, obviously, he, he is the sacrifice. He's the cleansing blood. But at the same time, as, as Tosin alluded to, I mean, he, he bore our iniquities, bore our sins outside the camp. So maybe one sense, is he both? I, I think he's both goats. Uh, he's the goat, if you get what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> thank well you. Yeah. Well yeah. Yeah. Yep, thank you. I'll be here all week. Um, yeah, I think he is. Actually, I won't. We're going out of town tomorrow. Uh, I think that he is both goats. Um, to Brian's point, he's also the high priest. He's also the temple, the dwelling place of God, or the tabernacle. He tabernacled among us, John chapter 1. So, uh, yeah, I mean, from the th things y'all are saying, the thing about these comments touching on, 
every you know, kind of element of the Day of Atonement, and Jesus fulfills, fulfills all that, which is so amazing and so rich to see all of that uh, come to its, its fulfillment. And to your question, Jordan, and to the comment Brian made earlier, I think in, like, for instance, just taking the two goats, each of those goats, uh, you'd say, there's something special and something we learn about Jesus from each of those. So instead of just saying, oh, well, Jesus is all of it, and that's great, there is something specific. Um, and y'all have already said it, but Tosin referenced Hebrews 13. The Hebrew writer making a very specific point to say Jesus bore our sins like that scapegoat that was kicked out of the camp into the uncleanness. Jesus went out, became an outcast, rejected by his own people, a criminal, spat upon, humiliated for all to see. Jesus was the scapegoat. He bore our sins and our iniquities and the reproach. Therefore, in that passage, the Hebrew writer says, you go out with him. You join him as a reject, as an outcast, as someone who has shame brought upon you because you wear the name of Christ. And wear that proudly, we might say, not boasting in ourselves, but boasting in Jesus and we are in our association with him, right? But the sin offering, all the stuff we probably more commonly talk about, about Jesus had to die. And so we get the, 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 the blood of Jesus that is shed through a horrible death and that blood sprinkling us clean. And so... Yeah, and every element, I think you get a different facet that is significant and important and helps us in some way understand what Jesus has done for us and then what, what, uh, what happens to us and what we can give thanks for. Which is why, and this is in terms of our goals, uh, we've really talked about two of our goals, uh, the first two today. We've talked about, as we finished up the laws of, of impurity, taking seriously the holiness of God and drawing those firm boundaries between holiness and unholiness, if we're going to live in God's presence. But then the second goal of this class, to give thanks for Jesus, our atonement and our high priest uh, and what he has done for us. Okay, in the booklet, you had these verses and I have these verses here if we wanted to go through them, um, but uh, you could do that on your own time and continue to think about these things as we go. All right, what does atonement mean? To cover, right? Um, why is it important in Leviticus? Sin has to be covered over for God to dwell with him. What's done with the two goats on the Day of Atonement? One goat? Yeah, one the scapegoat that bears sins away. The second goat is the sin offering uh, that is killed for the blood to purify. And then uh, compare and contrast actions of the high priest with Jesus. This came through in, in what Brian said, so I'll just reiterate because we didn't talk directly about it, but Brian said, as opposed to the high priest, Jesus is the high priest. So there's a comparison there. The high priest makes an offering. In Leviticus, he's offering an animal. Jesus, the high priest, is offering himself, and that would be one. And all those passages I gave you in Hebrews um, talk about those differences between Jesus and the priest. Okay? All right, class number seven. We will focus on that. We're not going to catch up yet. We'll catch up soon. Class number seven for next week, there's a sermon in the booklet that you can go listen to. But most importantly, read the next three chapters, 18, 19, and 20. Uh, look at the, the questions in your booklet and be ready to discuss next Sunday. Thank you, guys.